Hey, it's Melissa from Welcome to the Woods. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I laid brand new flooring in my kitchen remodel. First thing to do was to rip up the old floor that was in there. There was actually four layers. And so the height of it just was not gonna work with something else laid on top. After I finally got that out, I was ready to prep my subfloor. Now, there's a couple things you wanna do in the days leading up to your installation. You wanna bring your flooring inside to acclimate to the house's temperature and humidity. This should be done at least 48 hours before install. The flooring that I'm installing is the Mohawk Revwood Select. It is a laminate floor, but it is completely waterproof. And I'm gonna show you more about how to waterproof a click together floor like this later down in this video. I got my flooring from zenetflooring.com. This is my third time working with them. And thank you to them for sponsoring this video. Now to prep the subfloor, you have to fill any gouges. And I found this skim coat and patch flooring product at my hardware store. And I'm just going to scoop that into any pieces that are at least an eighth of an inch wide or deep gouges in the subfloor to get everything flat and stable. Now you don't have to fill every little hole. I had about a billion holes from staples that were pulled from the previous floor, but I'm not gonna fill every one of those. I'm just gonna fill anything that creates a unevenness on the subfloor of more than an eighth of an inch across a four foot span. After that, I went around and I made sure all the little nubs from the staples were gone I just felt my subfloor with my hands and made sure everything was smooth. There were actually a lot of residual nubs of staples that I had to pull out with my needle nose pliers. So I ended up going across the entire floor on my hands and knees and feeling all over, making sure it was all ready. After this, you're gonna wanna sand everything. And I just used a random orbital sander hooked into a shop vac to create less dust. I sanded everything to catch any imperfections and also to sand down the patching material flat. Now give the subfloor a good vacuum and you are finally ready to begin installing underlayment. Now the underlayment is a real sound underlayment that has both sound protection and moisture protection. It has a plastic layer on the bottom that is like a vapor barrier. If you are installing over a concrete, this is especially important to have a vapor barrier. I'm installing over a wood subfloor. So this is just an added protection to help that floor maintain its waterproof status. So this underlayment had the tendency to want to roll up on itself and it was kind of frustrating to get started, but I just would use painter's tape temporarily to hold down the edges and heavy objects. And I'm measuring around a bump out that I have to deal with from the doorway. I actually had a lot of measurements to account for when I'm laying this floor because I want to lay it throughout both the kitchen and the living room space. And so the planks are gonna go through the doorway that connects them and run the length of that entire space. For right now, I'm just installing underlayment and flooring in the kitchen area because I'm not ready in the living room to work on that yet. So after getting the underlayment placed and cut out around all my cabinet boxes and everything, I'm going to show you how the next row of underlayment connects. So you'd actually don't need any tape on this. It's a clever design where there's a bit of the vapor barrier, that plastic that's on the bottom of the underlayment that kind of rolls out on one edge. And then the edge of the other roll of underlayment has an adhesive strip with just like a little liner on top of it that you can take off and you can press down that adhesive strip onto the plastic underlayment. This allows the two rolls of underlayment to hold together before you get the weight of the floor on it kind of holding it into place. The underlayment should not be attached to the subfloor. It should be floating as well. So I just cut everything up. At the end of the roll, it's important to use extra tape and weight because it really wants to roll up on itself. But once I got that ready to go, I'm finally ready to start laying planks. The first thing you want to check is that your flooring height goes underneath all your casing. Mine got lucky on the casing. Um, and it fit perfectly underneath from what the height of the old floors were. But if not, you need to use an oscillating multi-tool to cut that. So that was great, but then the door, I didn't get lucky. When I tried to open the door, it caught and it wouldn't open. So I used my oscillating multi-tool there to trim off the bottom of the door, just marking it and then carefully cutting it, cleaning up my mess. And now the door swings open perfectly. The first plank you lay really involves a lot of math and planning. And so you need to make sure you know kind of the design of your entire floor before you get started. Here's what I'm working with. I have this weird situation where 
my living room comes next to a stairway, comes next to a doorway, and then it comes back up, but not all the way to the other wall. It comes up against cabinets. So all of these are different heights. This drawing isn't very straight. Let me try again. So here's a better depiction of what I'm dealing with. Now, when I'm running my flooring um, this direction, the long ways, I need to account for a measurement that none of my ends are gonna end up less than two inches. I need to take the width of my planks, which is seven and a half inches, and measure here, here, and here to make sure that it works out. None of my ends here, 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 and here are gonna come out to two inches. It's also good to measure the entire floor and make sure your last row also is wider than two inches. So that being said, I calculated that I was going to need to recess one of my planks into the door jam. So I'm cutting out with my jigsaw the area where this is gonna go around like the wall that's on either side of the doorway. This is the first plank I'm laying because this is the most difficult spot to get measurements down. With this recessed three inches, all my plank measurements are gonna work out really well for the floor. So you can see that I'm dry fitting it into place to make sure that that's gonna work and the door is gonna open. Then I also cut a piece to bring it to the stair threshold um, to add on. And I'm gonna do that ahead of time because the edges of this is gonna go underneath the casing. So I won't be able to add that two and a half inch wide piece at the top of the stairs after I get this other piece laid in. Connecting them ahead of time just makes it simple. Another thing I'm adding here, you wanna pay attention are spacers. These spacers need to be placed around all the perimeter of the flooring wherever you can get them. They measure a 3 8 inch gap around the floor which laminate and vinyl floors need so that they can expand and contract with heat and humidity changes in the environment. Now that I have my starting point, I'm going to plan out my pattern. And my planks are 7.5 inches wide by 54 inches long. And if you see here, I can plan out to stagger the seams. At first, I was thinking, oh, I'll stagger them every foot, 12, 24, 36, 48. But that is going to make it so that at the end, I have a seam which is less than 10 inches away from another. So you don't want that. In order to create a pattern that looks uniform, I decided to stagger at every 11 inches. So 11, 22, 33, 44, then my last seam is 10 inches from the end. That's gonna work really great. I wanna keep this pattern no matter what so that I don't accidentally end up with seams too close that compromise the floor. In this clip, you see the three main installation tools. You will need a tapping block, you also need a mallet, and mine has like a harder side and then a rubber side. The rubber side being for tapping seams down and then the harder side being for using on the tapping block and on the black bar. The black bar is like a special flooring install tool that helps you close in the ends. I don't actually know what this one's called, but <laughs> you'll see its purpose right here. When you have a piece where it comes up to the edge and you can't get your tapping block in, you use this black bar to put pressure on and close the seam between planks. In order to get a really beautiful designed floor, you need to plan out your pattern. So I am gonna lay the first row and work from there, but right here I'm showing you how I'm choosing to stagger my planks. You remember that I have five different measurements I'm staggering at, which means my pattern of seams won't repeat for five rows. Now I am measuring them where they need to be and I'm not just stepping them down in a uniform pattern. I don't really like the way that that looks. Instead, I'm alternating and staggering it. That way when you look at the floor, it doesn't look so man-made. It looks a little more interesting. So in order to cut the row that goes up against the cabinets, which I guess technically in this room, this that's my first row, I'm gonna run all of the planks on my table saw to cut off one end and make the width skinnier. It's good to be mindful when you're using your saw cutting the laminate flooring, whichever side of the blade gives you a cleaner cut. So on my jigsaw and on my table saw, the cleaner cut side is on the bottom. So I tend to cut the planks upside down whenever possible. So with this row to get it into place, I'm going to connect the short seam first because it will be impossible for me to lean up the plank underneath the cabinets. Then once I have that seam tight, I will slide it into place under the cabinets and use the black bar to tap in the long seam. Be sure to remember 
on all of your edges to have those spacer blocks. The spacer blocks also give your flooring something to tap against. It can be hard to get the click together mechanism to connect if you don't have something solid to tap against. Now that I have my first row laid, my measurements planned out, and my pattern laid, I am going to just continue putting planks down and this is pretty easy. I just have a couple tips to share with you. I recommend using a tapping block for every single plank and even if you can force the click together system into place and push it tight, the tapping block just really secures the joinery and really prevents anything from coming apart in the future. Cutting laminate can be a very dusty job, so I'm always cleaning my underlayment here. I'm tracking in this dust just on my shoes because I'm not cutting in the same space that I'm installing. It's best if you can wipe your feet every time or if you have a, a partner to help you install the floors, you can have them do the cutting and you doing the install. That will keep your underlayment and your floor much cleaner. Sometimes when you are measuring the end of a row, it's best to just flip your plank backwards and mark it and then you can cut it on your jigsaw without having to even use a tape measure. Whenever you're measuring, make sure that you do not include the click together joinery and you account for the 3 8 inch gap. Now I wanna talk a little more about the floor itself. Um, this floor is beautiful, isn't it? I actually picked this floor without seeing a sample ahead of time because I just knew from the picture online it was gonna be exactly what I wanted for my modern cottage style kitchen and that it would go well with the hardware and the cabinet color that I picked. If you're not familiar, I'm currently renovating this kitchen by myself. My last video that I published was about refinishing all these cabinets. And the flooring is just icing on the cake. I absolutely love how it looks. It is a wide plank, it's distressed. And it is such an added bonus that this laminate floor is actually waterproof. If you love the look of these floors as much as I do, you can buy them on zenetflooring.com. The link is in the description on this video. And they are extremely popular, so I had to wait a couple months for mine. Be sure to plan ahead when you're ordering flooring for your next project. When installing flooring in a kitchen, in my opinion, it's best to not run the flooring underneath the cabinetry for a couple reasons. One is that the height of the flooring is going to mess up with the standard height of your counters um, at 30 inches. And the other reason is because, like I said, the flooring actually shifts slightly and so it can cause buckling if you put something that is as heavy as cabinets and also rigid because cabinets are typically screwed into the wall's framing stud system. And so if you put something heavy and rigid on top of the floors, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on those joints for a floor that's supposed to be floating and slightly mobile. I also want to share that with the tapping block, it has a long side and a skinny side that you put up against the top of the floor. Don't get it against the click system because you want to make sure that that's protected. I try to use the long side as much as possible, but the shorter side is good for if you have a skinnier plank. Always pound against these spacers up against a wall. That gives you enough strength to put pressure on the joint and close it. These spacers are like little shims. They're wider on one side and skinnier on the other. And I didn't realize till I had been laying the floor for a while, the best way to put them in is like this, where they're sandwiched. So you put the thick one in first and then the skinnier one. And the reason is because this still allows the right size gap, but then it's easier to remove the spacers when you're done laying the floor. If you lay them in with the thick side on the bottom, when you come to remove them later, it's going to be really hard to pull them out as the pressure of the plank is pounded against it. So now for the last row. This row I also had to shave on my table saw, but my measurements came out that this would be 7 inches, and so it's nice and wide and I have enough space to work. If this row is really skinny, it makes it more difficult. Here is a clip of me cutting with my jigsaw around the obstacle of the heating vent. And the blade that I'm using on my jigsaw is actually a scrolling blade and it's by material. So it has a lot of teeth because you can even cut metal with it. This is the right blade for laminate. And the very last plank is going in. Isn't that so satisfying? And one thing I want to do now is invite you to follow me on TikTok or Instagram. Both of those accounts are smaller than my YouTube channel and Facebook, but they are really fun. I do a lot of short video clips of my projects and you get to see behind the scenes of what I'm working on. 
Now with the floor laid, it is time to remove all of the blue spacers, and I'm going to do that extra step to ensure that this waterproof floor doesn't have any damage from spills. So I'm going to be installing backer rod, and this is part of the installation instructions for this particular Revwood Select flooring. You remove your spacers and you put in small backer rod push down in the seams, the gaps around the floor until it is flush. You want it flush so that it doesn't interfere with any baseboards that you add in the future. Now with the backer rod in there, it allows the floor to expand and contract as it needs to because it's foam, but it fills the gap enough that we can run silicone sealant along the edges to keep water out. So now I'm going to run 100% silicone along the bottom and top edges of the backer rod so that if water falls on the top surface of the floor and it goes to the edges, the sealant will keep it out from getting underneath the floor and compromising it. So I did this process around the perimeter of the entire room, filling the small gap on the edges of the floor with the backer rod, covering it in the silicone caulking, and then when the silicone was finally dry, I came to replace baseboards. I don't have to replace a lot of baseboards because um, there's just like one wall where it's visible and I'm going to be putting the toe kick down on the bottom of the cabinets. This is a piece of three quarter inch plywood I cut to size, painted to match the cabinet color, and this is going to cover the gap at the edge of the flooring beautifully. And that's it, I'm done. I love the way that this flooring looks. I think that the color works with my design beautifully and I can't wait for what's left in this kitchen remodel. The next thing I'm gonna be doing is getting countertops fabricated and installing the open floating shelf. I'm also working up a custom hood design, which is exciting. So if you wanna follow along my kitchen renovation, be sure to subscribe and you can hit the notification bell so that you know every time I post a new video. Because I only laid the flooring in the kitchen for now, I left a spot going into the living room where it's open and those planks will continue on as I lay flooring through the living room in the future. Thank you so much for watching Welcome to the Woods. I hope I inspired you with this flooring install and we will catch you again next week.